Well, hello everyone and welcome to this first of the forums today. Uh, again, delighted that you can join us at Blackwood Uniting Church for our Climate Action Resources Expo, which will be a mix of many, many exhibitors and some very wonderful speakers during the day. Uh, first up, uh, we are delighted to welcome Professor Chris Daniels, who will be talking to us about greening cities in the era of climate change, how and why. And I think Chris has probably got more job titles than anyone I've ever seen in my life. I think because the list was getting too long, he let go the CEO of Adelaide Oval. That was just <laughs> adding to the list too long. But Chris is a very well-known environmentalist. He's a very well-known biologist. Um, he is CEO of the not-for-profit organisation Koala Life. He is the uh, presiding member of Green Adelaide presiding member of, was the presiding member of the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Rangers Board, has been long involved with Cleland. He is adjunct professor of biology at the University of South Australia and adjunct professor of zoology at Adelaide University. He has published many books, more than 250 scientific and community publications. Chris, we are absolutely delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, and it is wonderful to, to be here um, at the, the CARE Forum, and it's fabulous that the, the Blackwood United Community um, is really interested in tackling these issues up here, um, and of course, Blackwood has been at the forefront of a lot of the greening initiatives and the responses, and of course, last two weeks ago was at the forefront of the consequences of these sorts of challenges that we face as well, so it's a uh, really interesting to have that discussion and have the community engaged um, in this space. And I'm going to be talking about, particularly about Green Adelaide and why it came in and what's its role um, now in creating a, a community that is sustainable and connected. And yes, it is enormously about the response of urban communities to climate change. Um, and it's also the major mechanism really that communities can do this. One is about managing energy, um, and other speakers will talk about that. And the second is managing greening, and that's mostly what I will talk about. Now, the first point that, that we need to really understand is that the world's population is growing at an extraordinary rate. We just passed 8 billion people on the planet last week. I don't know whether it's a cause for celebration or commiseration, but that's the issue. Um, we can see how fast the world's population has grown. This is back um, since, well, this is about 1900 here, um, and the world's population has escalated dramatically. So when my father was born in 1932, there were about 2.6 billion people on the planet. When I was born in 1960, there's about 3.6, or there was about 3.6 billion people on the planet. So over a period of 28 years, the world's population grew by 1 million. When I hit 50, that was up to 7 billion. So it has grown by well over 3 billion people. Um, now it's 8 billion. If I hit 90 years of age, it'll be 11 billion people. So we're seeing this massive explosion in the world's population. More people now than ever before, uh, and growing and um, expanding as we, as we speak at an extraordinary rate. And people are moving into cities around the world. This graph shows the proportion of the continent that um, lives in cities from 1970, the blue bars, uh, to 2025, the black bars. And what you can see in continents like Africa, traditionally that was a rural-based population with only about 25% in cities, um, and now it's up over 50%. Then you can see that in places like South America and North America, uh, over 80% of the population will live in cities by 2025. You will note on this graph that Australia isn't represented because already way back in, in 2000 more than 80% of people lived in cities, predominantly the big five, the capital cities. South Australia is the most urban of the states in Australia with more than 85% living between Victor Harbour and Port Wakefield. So even though we're an enormous state, we actually are really clustered around uh, the, the city of Adelaide. And that's unfortunate because the area we inhabit is also a biodiversity hotspot. And the hotspot is one of those locations where there's a 
disproportionate number of species of plants and animals for the particular area. Uh, there are only 15 biodiversity hotspots in Australia, uh, only one in South Australia, and that's the Mount Lofty Range, Adelaide Plains, Kangaroo Island little bio unit here. And it's a biodiversity hotspot because of the arrangement of the Mount Lofties, which come up at about 45 degrees, creating a, a giant floodplain here, um, which gets variable rain. So the rainfall up at Piccadilly is about 1.2 metres per year. At Kent Town, it's about 550 mils. And at Semaphore, it's about 300 mils. So there's a fourfold variation in rainfall because our rain comes from the south and west, it sweeps across, hits this westerly face, pushes up and down she comes. Lots of rivers and creeks traditionally ran into the, to the Adelaide Plain. Most of them stopped around the parklands or finished up in a big wetlands area called the reed beds where water was trapped behind the line of sand dunes. So you end up with this variation in ecosystems called micro ecosystems that were driven by soil type. So soil type is sandy from a line that runs from about there called the parafault up through that line there through the hill space. Um, the sandy soils gave rise to open mallee, to grasslands here, to samphire and the really low-lying acid sulphide soils um, and the grey mangrove forests down around uh, up the Lafeva Peninsula. Um, along the hill space zone, well, this is grey box grassy woodland, wonderful to see the grey box community represented here today, and then through the, uh, along all of the creeks and streams that came down off the Mount Lofties, you have riparian habitat and you have rushes, reeds and so forth. So you had different communities like these scattered across the, the, the state, each with its own collection of animals um, that reflected these different ecotypes. And this biodiversity meant that within this area, there were about 60% of the state's birds, some 30% of the state's plant species, and 25%, give or take a bit, of mammals, reptiles, uh, and amphibians, and fish, all in this one area. If we could have made one part for the whole state to reflect the biodiversity of the region, the location was right here. We didn't do this for the obvious reasons. Uh, open mallee uh, forest, uh, grasslands, and um, grey box grassy woodlands are really easy to clear. You can run sheep on them, great farming land, very easy to turn to horticultural practices down in the south, so lots of plants could be grown there, and then the big wheat and sheep farming up to the north took over. So it was, of course, the great place to build a, to build a community. And that's great. We can do that, and we can build the community here, but we are building on an area of great biodiversity. So we really need to understand within a community context the incredible value for biodiversity. And there's a number of reasons why it's incredibly important. The first is biodiversity is a really big part of providing ecosystem services. So an ecosystem service is giving what we need to survive. And that's clean air, it's fresh water, and it's great clean soils to grow our plants and um, grow our foods and so forth. Biodiversity through fungi, through bacteria, through microbiome, through a complexity of systems that process wastes and pollutants is incredibly important in providing high quality ecosystem services. The other thing biodiversity does is that it provides resilience and ability to recover from challenge. Now we are undergoing increasing challenges now. We've just had one two weeks ago. Look at the rest of Australia underwater. Two years ago it was fire. These Increasing frequencies um, and intensities of events um, as a result of this now 1.7 degree increase in, in world temperature are creating an enormous challenge. So we need a society, a community and systems that are able to bounce back. So we call that resilience, the ability to recover. And systems recover the greater the richness and complexity of the biodiversity components because they improve the... The, the, the air, they process the water after flooding, they allow the soils to recover, all those sorts of things. Uh, of course, biodiversity provides us with our food. We are discovering new food types every year. At the moment, there's a lot of focus on indigenous foods and food provision. Um, and also, of course, biodiversity provides us with the majority of our medicines, which come from either plants or fungi. So we get a lot of those sorts of supports from biodiversity. And then we can be really selfish and go, you know what, biodiversity supports the economy too. 
we have an enormous amount of activity in ecotourism um, and in providing places that people want to come for tourism and for recreation. Uh, there we go. So here's an example. Obviously, we're going to might have to be a bit playing around here. Koalas, um, which we find all over the place up here, and there were quite a number that were ever on a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> are worth uh, $3.2 billion in 2014 to the Australian economy. And that was driven primarily by people coming to wildlife parks and, and to places like Kangaroo Island to observe these animals. They're also used in a huge array of other tourism um, and business related activities. This is kind of a weird poster from China in 2017. It's actually it's a bit creepy, really. And of course, every every politician that arrives here is automatically given a koala to hold. I think it's actually in the Constitution. <laughs> um, and you can see here that. Um, when Katy Perry came and held, this is Murray the koala up at Cleveland um, a couple of years ago, she tweeted this. It got a million hits. Um, and we wound up with an increase in visitation of about 30,000 people over the next year. They all wanted to come and cuddle the koala that Katy Perry covered. Of course they did. Um, well, we had lots of Murray, let's put it that way. <laughs> the, so that there's all of those reasons. There's even more important reasons why biodiversity in an urban context is really important. And COVID has told us and showed us that in fact we need open spaces in nature to deal with the challenges of pandemics. And these are the, the physical ones immediately, getting exercise and um, health and well-being, but in particular um, mental challenges. Uh, the depression and anxiety, particularly from kids, was really a big issue and remains a big issue and will probably be a big medical issue for the next decade or so because of people being trapped uh, inside. We got lucky. One, we only had fairly short periods of lockdown, but the second reason is we're a low density in general city. So we had front yards, back yards, wide streets, trees, and you could go out there and go walking around. People in Melbourne were locked in for almost nine months, many in towers with 27 floors in them. Uh, so if you're in a four-room apartment block for nine months, um, 20 floors up, you're not going to do well. You're, you're just not going to do well. And so um, that ability to connect with nature through the pandemics and the lockdowns has really revealed an incredibly important part of creating a sense of place. And lots of organisations have popped up that um, help kids connect with nature, nature play, healthy parks, healthy people, nature prescriptions and so forth. And they're all incredibly valuable. That sense of place, that sense of who we are, um, that we are Adelaideans, South Australians, Australians, therefore very different to everybody else around the world, is a sense of place. And it's something that we are really proud of. My best example of that um, comes from Harry the Huntsman. How many of you have had a Huntsman in your house? Yes. <laughs> How many of you have had some sort of story, experience, <laughs> challenge that you tell over the dinner table that, you know, your kid found a, one in the sink? that. You know, Dad ran around with a rolled up newspaper and fell over the lounge chair. There's always some, but it comes down from your the car visor, that it's in the letterbox. See, most of you are smiling now because there's some story like that that we are really proud of, because, or at least we accept. It's part of living in Adelaide, and it's kind of our history and our sense of place. I have told that story well, about 10 years ago to 28 visiting mayors from China, and they looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> I, I am completely, completely loopy. No place would want to have a big huntsman like that, let alone tell stories, let alone smile about it. And most of you are smiling now, which makes it even worse because they would just go, but you can't be smiling. That's a terrible thing. And we go, oh no, we don't worry about huntsmen. See, it's the redbacks you've got to be a bit worried about because they're the poisonous, bitey ones. And they were just out. You know? So I uh, ran screaming out of the room and I set back relations between Adelaide and China by about 10 years. <laughs> But that's our sense of place, and that's our connection with nature that makes us different, and that's really important, especially for kids, because those sorts of experiences build that connection to community. If you don't have that, you have what's called placelessness, where um, particularly young people have no connection to the area. It's just a place to live, and it could be anywhere, right? So therefore, you often get um, disengagement with the community, therefore increases in petty crime, graffiti, those sorts of things. 
um, and we all know those to a big issue. And this sense of place is also a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Do you want me to click the I think line? if you wouldn't mind, just, just click it forward. There should be a little arrow. I think that would be easier if I could just wave my thing at you. Perfect. I'll say click forward. It's also a worldwide phenomenon, and we saw this with the the fires recently, you know, the, the black summer of uh, 1920 was um, a really big issue worldwide and Australia was um, devastated. So 2% of Australia burnt over that period from August to February. 21% of Australia's forests were destroyed um, in that event. But it wasn't the worst fire that occurred at that same time. The actual worst one from a biodiversity point of view was the Amazon, which was absolutely mm -hmm. devastating. There was also horrendous fires up the west coast of the US from basically San Diego to Washington State um, that was devastating. Uh, there was a huge fire in Siberia, which I think is still burning in some of the areas, and other fires in the Mediterranean. They didn't get much coverage. That all of the fires in Australia got this enormous worldwide coverage because of this little guy, and pictures <laughs> like that that swept the world, and it galvanised world focus onto Australia's destruction of its biodiversity. And people sent huge amounts of money. Um, Wires received $200 million. Uh, WWF was $50 million. Many other organisations got tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to save this little guy. And people didn't just send money. Um, they got knitting. And there were knitting groups appeared all through the US and Europe that made joey pouches, um, um, that made mittens for koala, for burnt, burnt paws, and made huge numbers of bird's nests. And they made bird's nests from tiny little knitted wrens to ones that could rest a cassowary. You know, these huge things. We didn't actually need any bird's nests because the birds weren't nesting, and most of the, there were plenty of hollows because all the trees were all burnt out. So, but they would knit huge amounts of these things and then ship them, and they shipped them up to us in Cleveland, and we just got pallet load after pallet load of this sort of knitted stuff. So if anyone wants a knitted bird's nest, pop up and feel it and we'll see what happens. Thank you. So you think with all of these reasons for the sense of place, for the importance in dealing with pandemics and lockdowns, creating communities and all these other things, it would be really easy to champion biodiversity in an urban context. In fact, it isn't. It's incredibly difficult. And Nina is going to be talking about all sorts of other challenges around this um, coming up. But one of them is this culture of fear. And we've been really terrible about telling our story about Australian wildlife. In fact, in general, we've told stories that wildlife is actually here to kill you. That Australian wildlife is the most lethal, um, and if you spend any time outdoors, the snakes will come and rip your face off and eat your children. And if the snakes don't do it, the spiders will. Don't go near the ocean, because the great whites will take you out. And if they don't, the blue ring octopus, the jellyfish, you name it. And in fact, it isn't true. We have incredibly low uh, mortality and morbidity rate for wildlife uh, compared to the rest of the world. We don't have bears. Mm. Always start off not having bears. Bears are a very good way to take out idiot people, particularly in North America. Um, and um, also, we don't have diseases like the Black Plague, uh, rabies, and so forth. So a chipmunk can kill you in the US. But we have all these other characteristics as well. Fear of trees is currently a big one, and our recent events with the, the storm has exacerbated the debate about trees and their potential to do damage. And then, of course, bushfires are always there around um, the fear of nature. So nature should be pushed outwards and be excluded from a community. Thank you. So we build communities without nature. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is a painting of the village in Brazil. It's called the One Tree in Riku there, and it really is meant to show the sorts of communities that are appearing worldwide, um, and these are other ones. And this is this small block infill, large house, small block, um, and nature is excluded. That's at Aldinga, and that was sold as a sustainable community because you didn't have to water everything, or anything, really. And what that does, too, is encourage kids in particular to spend more time inside, more time on electronic apparatus, uh, more time killing Nazi zombies with a friend in Finland than going out riding your bike with a friend down the street. And you create communities that use more energy, um, that have much more wastewater, um, so it reduces water recycling, 
um, and it also excludes biodiversity. Thank you. And this is a good example. This is up here. So even in our very green community, on one side of the street, we have a 1950s, 1930s and 50s community. You see houses on large blocks, big backyards, lots of big older trees. Um, and this area has lots of biodiversity in it because of its greening. You'll notice most of the roofs are not black. Um, and so the energy consumption here is a lot less. Other side of the road, one significant tree, but effectively no greening, lots of black roofs, large houses. This area, in our studies, is about two degrees hotter in the summer and about two degrees colder in the winter with substantially more water discharge. It does have much greater energy use. So we wind up with these challenges of the communities that we make. Next, please. And this brings us to Green Adelaide. So Green Adelaide was created um, out of the Natural Resources Management Board system, um, and that was a system that came into play in 2004 as a result originally of the Catchment Board system, which was again about looking at natural resources to deliver ecosystem services. Green Adelaide was brought in specifically as a natural resources management system that focuses on the city. So its job is to really treat all the resources we sit on, the biodiversity, um, the water, the soils, as an asset for the community and to create a cooler, greener, wilder, more climate resilient city. And this piece of art done by Uncle Alan Sumner, a Garner elder, really shows what um, we are about. It has all of the physical elements, the oceans, the rivers, um, the biotic elements, the trees, the green, um, the animals, um, the built environments there, the city there, wetlands, um, and this is an illustration of the community at the centre. So in other words, yes, we can keep 1.3 million people here, and we can have biodiversity, and when they work together, we have greater um, outcomes. Next, please. And we have seven priorities here that is enshrined in legislation, which came into effect on July the 1st, 2020. And those seven priorities are to look at, within our area, which stretches from Sarex Beach to the Gawler River, so encompasses the 17 councils of Adelaide, um, but doesn't include the Adelaide Hills Council. So our seven priorities are coast and marine, which is about 50% of the area. Um, they are the biotic elements of the city, so green streets, parklands and backyards, um, and also wetlands and rivers. Um, they are to preserve uh, inherent biodiversity um, and control and manage uh, feral pest plants and animals. Um, they're to engage in biodiversity and water sensitive um, urban design. Um, and to encourage nature education, which feeds into all of these. So we have all of these seven priorities. We take a levy, we take about $30 million a year that's collected by councils that you pay its little line on your, um, on your council rates, and it is spread across these seven priorities. Thank you. And it's also across four major programs um, that we do that are multi-year, really high level ones. And they include connecting with Ghana people, so Green Adelaide has an advisory board called Wapalai Kamanka, which is composed of leading Ghana elders, and means walking together, and they advise and provide knowledge in all of our projects and the programs. Um, we are doing rewilding, improving conditions so that animals can be brought back. Our target animal at the moment is platypus, and we'll hear more about that in the next time. Because platypus were here, we exterminated them by ruining most of our rivers. We have now brought the rivers back to a reasonable standard, so it's probably time to bring back the platypus where it belongs. National Park City, I'll conclude within a minute, um, and greening our streets and backyards. And this is really the major effort, thank you, um, that we focus on, is we can ameliorate the effects of climate change um, by controlling the extent of green that is in the concrete uh, jungle that is the city. And we can do this in a number of ways. Firstly, we have to know where the trees are. And we have to know what the issue is. When you look across the 17 councils, the issues are incredibly variable across our area. So there's very small numbers of trees in some of our areas, like uh, the western suburbs, which are traditionally industrial. And they're down less than, than 10% um, are actually tree. Many of our areas don't have very much open space. Unley's less than 5%. Prospect is less than 4% open space. So there's also not very much space to put trees most of the trees are in people's backyards. Then you've got areas like Mitcham and Burnside, which have a high tree canopy between 30 and 
but it's being reduced at a great speed um, because of development and that one block becomes three if a drive down Wake Road just there will really show what I'm, what I'm talking about there. So we're conducting a major examination simultaneously of the canopy um, using a process called LIDAR um, and the heat island effect. So is, are those spots without trees significantly hotter than adjacent areas and how do the two relate? Thank you. And these enable us to plan our investment. It would take hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars to get it all right initially. So how do we best invest? And is it retaining significant regulated trees in areas like here? Or is it planting up areas like Port Adelaide Enfield um, or supporting Clayford, which is also a big, dry, dusty area? Is it targeting some of the giant road networks that are huge? Um, areas of, of reflective heat. You go on the north-south motorway, have a look at the Darlington interchange. That's a nightmare. When we hit 50 degrees, do not be on the Darlington South Road Expressway because your chance of getting off it is pretty small. And we know this is a problem. Henry became a 50 degree city a couple of years ago. We got to 49.6 at Elizabeth two years ago in that Black Fire summit. So it's going to happen. And these giant road networks are going to be a nightmare. So how do we invest in, in planting up and making them greenways? A couple of other areas we particularly target. One is finding open space, and we always take suggestions from you about where good bits of, of um, uh, vestiges of open space exist. Ones we're really focusing on the moment are those down around La Fever Peninsula, Pelican Point, Mutton Cove, and Giant Island. A dry creek in the north as a, a linear corridor um, to, to improve that part of the area. Some of you will be well aware of Field River and Glenthorne National Park um, down south of the and, and the Washpool. The big future debate and issue is going to be the Hills Bay site because we have seen, really, it was established in the 1960s and some of you might have been involved in the, the, the bloodletting that was to retain the, the Hills Bay site and prevent development. A lot of the land that was in private ownership there is now appearing on the market and we are seeing houses creep up. So how we revisit the Hills Bay site um, as a protective environment is really important. Thank you. Um, we need to actually look at individual buildings and think about how we incorporate water sensitive urban design and biodiversity sensitive urban design. And there's great examples around the world. This is the Chicago uh, Municipal Chambers in the heart there. You actually take a, a lift up and you can walk through the garden, walk around and then go back down again. This is a, a, a municipal building in Freiburg in Germany. I really love it. It's got really bad hair there. Which is really great. Um, that's um, a Hilton in Bariloche in Argentina. And these are the walls and parts of the Bowdoin Brompton development. So we can incorporate water sensitive and biodiversity sensitive urban design. Thank you. And we can do it in complex ways and we can do it linking to our streets. So that's actually Main Road. Uh, oh, no, there's Main Road up in, in Mitcham here. Um, which has permeable pavers, so in fact collects a lot of water that is used to support these trees in the middle of the road. And these are incredibly valuable as they grow up to provide that shade to decrease the reflective heat from the, the roads there. There are people who say they're a traffic hazard because potentially cars can crash into them. The cars can crash into cars. We, we can't keep blaming trees for either our mistakes like that or for the wind or the other environmental areas. Trees are trees. They deliver a whole mass of services. And water sensitive urban design also does allow for water to be processed on site, collected off the road, pumped in the roof, green, down a wall, and supporting trees there. Thank you. We need to be very clever about um, the trees we select and also how we might use open space. So this is Windsor Park here. We can use footpaths, uh, Windsor Street, sorry, in Unley here, using footpaths and median strips are really important ways to incorporate green and obviously low, medium and high shrubs are really important. A choose wisely, these are silver birch here. You don't see silver birch anymore because it turned out they need way too much water and the drought and knocked them all out. You could tell who was cheating on the water restrictions in 2010 because the silver birches were still alive. Thank you. I'm nearly done here. Clever planning is actually the great thing at the moment and you'd be aware that there's a major review of planning and a real attempt to include greening and to develop a code for planning. Nina, Keith over there, Keith, Keith will be talking to you about the, 
the planning code. Green Adelaide has made a major submission really around the importance of trees and making sure that when further developments occur, we do have green space uh, both on the mum and dad developers through the developing of the communities. And this is really important. It includes things like a planting guide here, but also a code that will limit the number of black roofs, all massive changes, but Nina will talk about that much more. And it also will address the need and the what sort of look the open space will be, as well as um, on within properties. Multiple use is becoming really important, so we need to be thinking about schools, golf courses, even cemeteries can be greened up to make a real difference. Some of you might have been to uh, um, the Danish, uh, in the Copenhagen Cemetery. It's fantastic, it's all green. You go to most of our cemeteries and they're just big swathes of cement. I know that when I turn up my toes, I'd rather be in a green spot under a tree than under a big slab of archaeologist Chris Daniels. So there's a real opportunity then to look at how we might beautify cemeteries, wetlands in the middle of race courses. Uh, this is the East Parklands that have a role in a range of different functions. And then there's connecting the coast and the rivers to Greeny. And this is really important. This was recognised in 1917 by a really important planner named Charles Reed. Uh, he was the second major planner after John Edney Brown, um, and he was a big fan of the suburban garden movement because he had seen the cities in the 19th century Europe disappear into giant cement polluted things. And he didn't want that here. He designed Colonel Lake Gardens, um, and he designed a second ring of parklands, which is this light blue here in 1917. A linear park for the River Torrens, um, and a coastal park that connects them all there. So all of these became integrated. Imagine what we'd be if we built the second ring of parklands. I mean, the entire city and its management would be completely different. So, and that's a really good example. That's right, thank you. I'll go to the next one. We do need to manage wildlife. It's a challenge. Um, it's perhaps easier to convince communities to manage snails and millipedes. Hell of a lot more difficult to manage koalas, um, even though you know, they are endangered nationally. They're incredibly cute and really important economically. They are a particular challenge to our trees um, because they eat koala eats about 50 trees a year. Um, we could have a whole session on possums in your roof. Um, and I'd rather not, because you'd probably kill me. Um, and bats and, of course, corellas are moving in everywhere as well. So we have to take seriously our role in management. We can't just leave it alone. Thank you. So all of these are part of that concept of a national park city. What if we live in and with the environment and not exclude it or not treat it as something that's out to ruin our lives? And the national park city movement started in... London, that was the first city to become a national park. Um, they sort of self-proclaimed themselves the first national park um, and then instituted a really difficult set of criteria to meet, which certainly sparked a lot of discussion and argument within our community about whether we are one and what does that mean. And it means something different to everyone. Um, it can mean about greening, it means about spending time in, in nature, about connecting communities, dealing with sense of place, all these things and more. Thank you. Um, it is about living in, on and with the land, um, and much of that is easiest <laughs> to demonstrate by demonstrating the connection to Ghana people, because they have very strong sense of place here. So we do um, a lot here with igniting culture. Thank you. So the National Park City concept really is one that we can hang our hat on. That's what we did to the River Torrens by the 1950s. We can't have areas like that anymore. We need to convert them from there to there, the way we know we're successful is that we can release those little guys and we can have them back. If we do that, then we're living in, on, and with nature. It also is a way, thank you, um, to deal with our challenges. Managing the environment in the city is like hurting butterflies, strong views, lots of different challenges, and things keep changing um, and creating new and unexpected challenges. This is my favorite example of these challenges. Um, these are corellas. Um, this is on a cold day, I actually took this in Sydney, and they were cold, and they had learnt, because they're really smart birds, where to warm up, and the warmer spot around were the red traffic lights in the major intersections. <laughs> so all of the traffic lights here had corellas in there, warming themselves up, they had a great time. They didn't care that down below was traffic chaos, right? <laughs> the people smashing into each other left, right, and centre, because they couldn't see whether the lights were red or not. So there you go, we have some challenges there. In conclusion then, sustainable activities are not significant without a biodiversity component. 
You have to have it in everything we do and in the way we think. It's embedded into our social contract, uh, into our environmental contract and our creation of communities. We can only make a sustainable community if we engage in biodiversity. And secondly, that the environment is no longer the driver for social change. Traditionally, social change has been brought about by some form of devastation, a disease or a plague, a war, economic collapse, religious persecution, all of these sorts of challenges that have led people to move and reconstruct. Our challenge now is the environment. It's, it's climate change uh, induced uh, changes to our structures, it's also our direct interaction, the clearing of, of habitat, um, and the production of pollution. Um, all of these um, and pollution products, and we create cities like this. This is Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and it's pretty much how we are viewing the creation of most of our cities. But that's not really fair, because this is also Riyadh. The picture I showed you before was that top bit. They have realized that that top bit is, is unlivable and unsustainable, so set up a huge amount of green space that turned their roads into green roads. And so by 2020, they had used recycled water from all of the residents here, established lakes and water systems that greened up this giant park. But in particular, it greened up the road. Um, and this road then now receives a reasonable amount of shade and has a really strong cooling effect. So if they can make that sort of change, so can we. Thank you. And I will finish there. Thank you very much. minutes of questions if you wish Michael. Yes uh, and uh, just to uh, inspire your uh, your questions uh, we have some giveaways today at different points of the day so in this particular session there will be two giveaways two gifts for the questions that Chris likes the most. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> any questions? <clears throat> you first? But, yeah about the slugs coming down and all the water it's killing all the fish up Yep. It's all polluted, and you're talking about introducing the platypus. How is this going to affect the water that slowly comes through our system? See, that's a, a great question. Um, the water coming down the system at the moment is coming from Lees from the Hume Dam, it's coming from the Lachlan, the Murrumbidgee, and the Darling into the Murray. So that's affecting the Murray system. When that happens, it's a local disaster, but you've got a, if you've got a good biodiverse system, it's resilient and it that comes back really, really quickly. So what you see is that water will spread out over the River Red Gum floodplains in a place like Pikes Lagoon, uh, Book Pernong and others. And a lot of it will discharge out of the sea, carrying nutrients, which actually helps the, the fish out there. So it is bad to start with because it's often black water. Um, and so there is a high fish and yummy one of dial initially. Um, although that, if you've got a good system, feeds the birds. So the birds do better because there's, there's more abundant uh, materials to eat. They have to have a resilient system to recover from that sort of challenge. The platypus is to be brought back to the torrents. The torrents didn't flood, um, and that's because it's been extremely well managed. It's been a lot of work by Green Adelaide, working with its partners, eight city councils, SA Water, and the EPA, to manage the water so you don't get those enormous pulses. Um, and the Ongapringa is the same. We used Mount Bold and Kangaroo Creek as both a detention basin and a water source, so we don't fill them up to the top. Um, the Victorian, New South Wales and Queensland dams, they fill them up to the top, and then they, they get into trouble when you may remember the Wyvernhoe Dam overspill into Brisbane a couple of years back. We don't do that. We make sure there's a gap, and then, then we release. So when they say our dams are 80% full, that's actually 100% full. That's what we want to deal with these sorts of challenges. So that incredibly good management, plus a combination of really good reeds um, and wetlands to actually filter out the stuff that comes in, really good trash wraps as a whole mass of really good system. It's been that the torrents is in a pretty good nick. We haven't had a blue-green algal bloom since 2012. We've had duckweed, but duckweed's not a poison. Right? So you do get a green look, but you don't get that smelly blue-green algal cyanobacteria that's a real challenge. That's what we want. So yes, it, there'll be a local disaster and it'll, there'll be a real tragedy for those of us who love wildlife in the short term. But if the system is resilient enough and complex enough, it'll recover even better. Great question, it's going to be hard to toss. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, mine's a, a little bit of a statement with a question to, uh, to Chris as well. But um, 
I think one of uh, one of my own observations, which I could be wrong about, but I think in the last two or three years around the whole biodiversity, you know, climate change and carbon, I think there's, a, there's one point of optimism is that I think the general population, even three years ago, there are a lot of people still questioning climate change, biodiversity loss. I think there's been a big change in the whole psyche across Australia now, and so come up on Chris's last slides that at least people now are really on side and they, are, they, they want to act, they want action, they want to do something about it. So I think uh, inside my own head I've said to people that, um, you know, there's a lot of bleak views with certainly with the environmental movement, but I think, say, three or four years ago, I probably would have raised our chances of getting through without major calamities being at about, you know, perhaps 10%. I think it's about 40% now, so it's improved considerably on that basis. So I just want to see what Chris thought about that. Well, it, um, it is it's a really, really good point. There was a, a cartoon that did the circuit about 10 years ago, and it's got one guy talking to the other guy, and he goes, what if we didn't need to make all these changes like improving water, putting in greening, um, lowering mm -hmm. energy consumption, getting rid of black roofs, and we didn't need to do it? Well, we've done all of that, which is really good anyway. It has all of these other benefits. So. Yes, we have we have well moved away from that, and it was it was an unproductive argument anyway, because we needed to do all of the changes that I've highlighted here and that Nina will highlight <coughs> for their own sake anyway. So we don't even need to have it. And then there's the world the world calamity, which is actually really triggering people to go, well, we'll deal with climate change, we'll deal with it in this way, and then all of these other benefits are just side positives. There's no downside to reducing our energy consumption and improving biodiversity. And, and just for one, just to extrapolate slightly. Well, just you need to give someone else a go. Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, just, just for the amount of deep rain. We have someone else here. Oh, yeah. sorry, that's cool. Let, no, let's have someone else, because you no, have cool, a yeah, no, no, How can we curb our population? Isn't it that main thing? Oh, that's, well, yes. I mean, that's that's the huge problem. Yeah. Um, there are, it's two problems, really. One one is the sheer number of people, which we get to 11 million. Mm -hmm. And the second is the amount of resources each person uses. So when we move to an urbanised community and we increase quality of life, we're actually increasing our resource utilisation. So um, people have the right to demand better food, so they want to eat more meat and less rice, for example, around the world. Um, there are far more items. You know, everybody wants one of these, which is filled with lithium and cadmium and all that sort of stuff. So um, we start using and mining. So it's, it's how much resources our footprint individually, plus the sheer number of people, that become a real problem. We can do something about the resources with much better management and particularly reducing pollution. Um, I mean, pollution is the third part of that, really, and you look at the plastic islands and so forth. Population change probably is unstoppable. Um, it's built into the religious fabric of so many communities. Um, it only ever worked practically in China when they went to the one child policy. That also created a lot of social up um, upheaval. Um, was very hard on women in China, if I remember, and girls were often either killed or um, quickly pushed off into orphanages. <coughs> um, and then now they've got a very uneven structure within their community. So even that is harder. It is true that the one way to make a real difference from population, and that is well recognised, is you educate women. Yeah. Mm. And where you don't have strong female education programs, you've got 9 to 15 babies. So, that's something that we can do, um, and then we have to keep championing is that you increase equality, freedom, and education for women around the world. I work in the land. You sure do. <laughs> and we're constantly removing introduced greens that are pests. Yes. Is it possible that we will ever win? <laughs> and does it matter if we don't? Do we have a new nature? Well, so there's the second question I think that at this stage it gets it because it is a new nature. The answer is no, you won't win. Um, so you have to work out. You won't win in that we'll go back to 1836. Your better question is your, and does it matter? Because when you create an urban community, you make one which is a mixture of the indigenous nature, pre-1836 nature, um, plus the cultural interests of the community themselves, which have changed since 1836. So we have palm trees all over the place. Palm trees are the stupidest trees. Even the long ones, the little short back Canary Island ones, they came here because they were really important ornaments for large gardens and really popular. 
Uh, many of uh, our other plants, roses, even soursops were brought out as garden ornaments in the 1860s because that was the cultural expectation. People love geraniums, they love roses. So they're a way to connect with nature. So in a city environment, I don't think it matters that we also have plants from around the world um, because they're a way that we connect and we build that sense of place and sense of community. Adelaide's a rose in there. What becomes important for you um, at the lair is you go, okay, so what do we have to do to make sure that we don't have blackberry run riot or onion reed or um, too many ash and elm and poplar and these things in areas that are of particular high biodiversity value? And that's, that's really important. So you become, which I know you do, I'm lecturing you about what you do. You're already really, really good at knowing this bit needs preserving. We'll keep the poplars at the end of Long Gully because that's part of the culture of, uh, of Belair National Park. Also, in some places, some of those areas actually protect endangered wildlife. Blackberries and bandicoots mm -hmm. are really good examples. Yellow-tailed black cockatoos and pine trees. Um, because we don't have enough hake here, they're actually doing well because they feed on the pine trees. So new relationships pop up and you wind up with dynamic urban ecological systems that aren't necessarily bad. Oh, yes. We always yes. talk about carbon in the atmosphere. Yes. What about the methane? Well, methane is actually carbon, CH4. Oh, right. um, and it, it is a greenhouse gas. It's about 40 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Oh, really? The advantage, if you like, for methane is that it's much more short lived. Yeah. So when we get major methane releases from places like the tundra, which is yeah. um, melting at the moment, and there's a lot of methane under there from the various. Uh, uh, plant matter that is there, that has a very powerful short-term effect, which can start to cycle um, and the positive feedback loop. So we do need ways to reduce methane. So it comes out of, out of tundra, it comes out of bogs, it also comes out of cattle. And so uh, there's a lot of really interesting work to, re to reduce methane production from cattle, um, including using feeding seaweed, which seems to um, absorb methane or also control the bacteria that make so yes, we do need to be very aware there are other greenhouse gases that have a whole range of different effects as well. And oh, I, just, I just wanted to, your comment about educating women uh, is very pertinent. I come from the Scandinavian countries mm -hmm. and we never had any trouble with yeah. two, two children per, per couple. That was always it. We didn't even talk about it. It happened. Uh, but how can you, how can people, how can people like you in positions of power and uh, uh, pe uh, educate people who have a lot of families that, that have no control over yeah. their quality. It's a, it's a Can really, it be done? Because it, it happens here in Adelaide as well. And yes. one of the big challenges are non-English speaking migrant communities yes. um, who often bring with a philosophy yes. that is about more children than more children. Yes. Over generations that changes, particularly when the women go to university, yes. the women become educated. So we put a lot of our work into nature education programs and a lot in the northern and western suburbs where there's those particular challenges. You're absolutely right that the Scandinavian and in fact most European countries really now have less children who are better educated and more prepared rather than have large numbers which traditionally um, was a, a, a sort of a response to having high death rates for children yeah. too, of course. And, you know, it was only three or four generations ago that that was right. So, yeah, great question. I, I think that's all we have time for in this session. Thank you very much for your attendance and participation. It's now up to Chris to pick his two favourite questions. Oh, look, they were, they were all excellent. I, I love that does it matter. That is such does a good question. So I'll give you the one here. Um, and your first one. Um, oh, about the water comes the floods. Yes, yes, about the floods, because that really is a way of looking at resilience. Um, and, yeah, you, you're going to lose. And we're seeing that with a lot of our forests as well. Two years on, they've done a lot better than before. So those two, brilliant. All right. Now, you have a choice. Depending on your food proclivity, you can either have a $25 voucher for the wonderful pizza men outside who will make you a pizza for lunch, which you can share with your friend. Or if you're feeling more healthy, here is a strawberry plant that you can take with you. This is a bit heavier, but more nutritious. So I'll let you fight over which one gets which. Now, uh, Chris, I would like to thank you so much for your wonderful talk. This is thank a small gift much. on our behalf for 
adding to our forum today. Please join me in thanking.